Over 2010 and 2011, graziers in Eastern Australia welcomed the exceptionally good seasons which broke the eight-year drought. Taking advantage of the unique conditions, Didi scientists and an innovative Western Queensland grazier teamed up to test the principles of adjusting stocking rates and wet season spelling to improve profits and condition of the country. This film is a record of a field day at Dunblane in Mitchellgrass country. Graziers converged from as far as 300 kilometres away to experience the results of a trial that shows how to make the most of the big seasons. Part of today is about handling the big season and uh, you know very much our challenge was in about October last year when it had, we'd already had really good opening rains in September. Oh, um, September 2010 was how to, how, to, how to take advantage of a big season. There was a, a very strong La Nina, more rain predicted. We had already had a heap of grass on, on the place, both dry grass and, and new growing grass. And, and, a, and so this, the other main part of today is to discuss how to take advantage of these big seasons and, uh, and to do it in a sustainable manner. David Council later explained how stocking rates are the main influence on his gross farm income and they are the factor over which he has direct control. I guess that's where the climate science tends to be at at the moment. The science side of the Dunblane trials is headed up by Dr David Phelps from Didi. Stocking rate is, is more important than genetics or breed or even, even the animal type that you choose. Um, it's more important than, than genetics and breed because you've got to have the feed and the quality feed available for the animals to be able to express those genetics anyway. If they haven't got decent feed, they're going to grow poorly, no matter how good their genetics actually are. And it's, it's then really about the ability to adjust stocking rates to match the season. Some of the economics that we did from the early 2000s, looking at a paddock that's in good condition, if we can carry 503 adult equivalents, which is a 450 kilo dry beast, the pro profit before tax would be around 35,000. Um, whereas for the same area in poor condition, running about half or a little bit less than half the number of livestock and a bit worse than halving the profits before tax. Uh, so year, year after year after year, that, that really builds and really erodes into the asset base. Wet season grazing rest. Um, we, we treated a few paddocks, you'll see them. I think we got a great response is the pasture's a lot denser and more solid. You certainly know when you're riding through it on a motorbike. Um, and any, any of those paddocks where I've done that treatment either last summer or the previous summer, um, you know, I know that they, they're able to withstand um, a much higher stocking rate. But good seasons, as far as I see, provide that opportunity to increase stocking rates um, and or improve land condition but also to prepare for the next drought through, through improving the land condition and improving finances. Uh, building business resilience, I guess, is what that's about. If you've got country in good condition and also your bank balance in good condition, then you've, you've got to be as best prepared for the next drought as you, as you could possibly be. So paddocks in good to fair condition, A to B condition, are the ones that can carry those extra stocks safely in the good seasons. Whereas paddocks in poor or C condition are the paddocks that I would recommend you actually take the opportunity in good seasons to improve their condition. So what about some of the stocking rate strategies for, um, for good condition paddocks? There's certainly really good opportunities to increase stocking rates in those good years. I mean, we've, we've had a look this morning, some of those paddocks are up to two, three hundred percent or more of the long-term carrying capacity at the moment, and there's, there's hardly a dent in the feed in, in some of those. Uh, and when you annualise David's stocking rates, as in just average it out over the year, the whole property is running at 135 or so percent above the long-term carrying capacity, and there's, you know, there's, there's no signs there of, of things going wrong. So I guess the message is that we, we don't have to be conservative all of the time. We can take advantage of these good seasons, and especially if country's already in good condition. Uh, a quick summary of our response was we did it with adjustment cattle, 
We've got quite a few paddocks stocked up quite highly. We've got one at the moment that's travelling at 6 DSC per hectare. So most of this country is about 1 DSC, so it's 600% higher than the stocking rate. So we'll have a quick peek into that paddock at the moment and we'll see a lot of paddocks travelling at 2 to 3. And we'll also see a few paddocks that are understocked. As well as increasing stock on areas in good condition, the good season provides an opportunity to recover areas in poor condition. And when I talk about wet season spelling, well, I like, I like the phrase that, that David's coined, um, summer rest grazing, uh, because it's always about grazing as well as spelling. So to me, you can't, you can't spell country if you're not already grazing it. Um, the point is that it's, it's country that is being grazed and you're giving it a break every once in a while to stimulate the Mitchell grass plants to respond, um, keep the business profitable. Part of our plan and what we did at, at Christmas time with, um, with David, we planned our paddocks that we wanted to summer rest, graze, and uh, we, we managed to achieve about 80% of those. And uh, at the moment, for the calendar year 2011, our annualised stocking rate, we're travelling at about 138% of our uh, long-term carrying capacity. For poor condition paddocks, I would recommend conservative stocking in general, even in good seasons, coupled with frequent wet season spelling. So country that's in poor condition may need two, three summers in a row of full wet season spelling to really get those Mitchell grass seedlings coming through and established, for instance. Um, and very rapidly reducing stock numbers in, in drought or in lighter seasons. Uh, just just to try and prevent further degradation and, and, and even less room to move when you've got poor condition country going into drought than if you've got good condition country. The bottom line for David Council is the economics of the two options he chose, wool sheep and adjustment cattle. My sheep gross margin is around that, but my adjustment income is around that on a DSC basis annualised. So these guys are making a lot more money than these guys. Um, so it does sort of, you know, that, that old sort of the shared portfolio, some of my shares haven't performed as well as others. After working over the figures, David had ruled out the option to buy. He found the big benefits of adjustment were regular cash flow and that it brought in a fair bit of money. In addition to spelling, modifications to infrastructure can more permanently resolve other land condition issues. We were, we were successful in getting a project up in DCQ at fencing off some areas of, of one of these one of our paddocks that's really suffering from uh, uh, degradation, and we had uh, degraded uh, light soil light soils in this area where the trees are. We had Mitchell Grass Country all in about sea conditions for the year. So this is just a picture of some of the degradation right up the, in the in the southwest corner. We fenced to land type, we divided the paddock into three, we minimised uh, the water distance by shifting the water points, and we, we did, and we implemented a strategy of being a really aggressive summer rest grazing um, in some of those areas of that paddock. We rested it for, for extensive periods of time. And so here's the fence here, we went off that corner, we went down to there, we ran that fence across there, and we put a water point there and a water point there. And we abandoned that water point there and we put one up on the hill here. And so that's what we did. We just rested the pastures from, from sheep. Not from kangaroos, but from sheep. And so it rained. So there it is in uh, September 09. And then in January 2010. And I wouldn't mind betting that that's all young Mitchell grass growing there, shoots of Mitchell grass. And that's what it's looking like now. Benchmarking is not just about historical stock numbers. So adjusting stock numbers, uh, well, we've, we've mentioned um, benchmarking against the, the current, um, sorry, your long-term carrying capacity or all the historical records for the property, uh, but also benchmarking land condition. So by that, I just mean going home and just doing an assessment of, of what you generally think each, each paddock is, whether it's in A or B condition or, or generally in, in C condition, and what opportunities that provides to actually uh, improve stocking rates over, over time. And feed budgeting's not just about those photo guides, for instance, of estimating the amount of feed on offer, 
It's also about understanding the intake of the different classes of animals that you have on your property. And that, uh, that handout for the adult equivalent and dry sheep equivalent ratings gives a guide to understanding what, um, what different classes of, of livestock will eat within a year. Uh, and it's important to compare apples with apples and, and consider what the animal intake actually is throughout the year when we're doing feed budgeting. Um, and monitoring. So we can have all of the theories in the world uh, and we can do all the spreadsheeting and you know, fancy computer stuff in the world, but there's not much point in just putting all of our faith in those tools. I mean, you've, you've still got to be out there monitoring, monitoring the land condition, monitoring the height of the grass as it's getting eaten down. How vigorous is the Mitchell grass, for instance? Is, is it looking a bit, bit tired? Are the individual tussocks starting to fragment and get broken up a bit, even though it's a good season? If they are, that's a probably, probably a good indicator that the stocking rate's been a bit, bit too hard for it, and it's time to give that country a wet season spell. Um, things like the Mitchell grass seed production, just as a guide for, okay, if it hasn't seeded for a couple of years, what's that mean for the amount of seed that's in the soil? That might actually mean that the the seed in the soil is actually running down a bit. And that might actually be a, an indicator to graze down to about the 20 centimetres over the dry season, because that will stimulate Mitchell grass to go to seed over the following wet season, provided it's at least an average wet season and it's, and it's spelled. There's ways to actually manipulate the Mitchell grass plant and get it to go to seed, for instance, and, um, and try and protect our, our long-term land condition. And things like seedling establishment. Um, if you've got country in poor condition, for instance, and there are Mitchell grass seedlings there, I'd say get the stock off straight away. You know, give it, give it a spell, give those seedlings a spell, give them a chance to really grow and establish so that they've got those big healthy root systems like we, like we saw in the, in the Mitchell grass seedling poster. Um, and there's a fact sheet in your information kits there as to how to identify a Mitchell grass seedling because it can actually be quite difficult to tell the difference between a little Mitchell grass seedling and some of the other grasses, especially when they're only yay high. Things like button grass and the bottle washers can look quite similar to Mitchell grass as a, as a seedling. And using tools like climate and pasture growth information, um, probabilities and forecasts, uh, they you know, there's, there's a lot of information out there. There's, there's a lot of tools out there. There are still some lessons ahead when the dry times return and the results of the Dunblane experiments play out. So we're still feeling pretty damn good about this, but it's only when I've got down the other side of it into a dry spell and I've managed to destock uh, and managed it well that you can, you know, you can say you, you, you've managed it well. This is a lot of a lot of cattle out there, and there's a lot of people that want to keep their cattle out there. So there's, you know, it's coming. We're, we're going to go like that eventually. We're going to, you know, unless I manage the destock well, both people's feelings and their expectations. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of psychology in making sure you get the destock right. When it comes to production, David knows it is not just about quantity of feed. This is the other thing. Coming up there on top of the hill, I reckon the future for me is to start looking at how to how to and then, Lou, you alluded to it about um, feed quality. And I, so I wrote down when we were eating shearing shed there how to graze to improve feed quality. We have this massive grading graph. By using a combination of adjusting stocking numbers according to the season and condition of the paddocks, introducing spelling, and improving overall grazing management, David improved his profitability. And David believes this approach is widely applicable across the Mitchell Grass Downs.